Yuri Alexievich Gagarin was born on the 9th of March 1934 in Klushino, a small village just over 120 miles west of Moscow. When Yuri was born, his family worked on a collective farm, which I suppose today you could call a community farm. Everyone in the collective would put something towards the community, so if you were a farmer, you would provide food. If you were a blacksmith, you would make horseshoes and tools. But everyone in the collective had skills or trades so the village could survive. His father, Alexei, was a carpenter and a bricklayer and his mother, Anna, was a milkmaid. Yuri had an older brother called Valentin, an older sister called Zoya, and a younger brother called Boris. In 1941, Klashino was occupied by the Nazis, and the Gagarin's house was taken away from them by a Nazi officer. And so the Gagarins lived in a nine square metre mud hut that they had built on the land behind the house. When the Nazis invaded, all schools were closed, and Yuri didn't have any education for two years. But Yuri loved reading, and when he wasn't helping out on the farm, he would read books by Victor Hugo, Charles Dickens, and the works of the Russian rocket pioneer Konstantin Solkovsky. In 1943, the Nazis sent Yuri's brother Valentin and his sister Zoya to a labour camp in Poland. They did manage to escape, but Yuri didn't see them again until 1945. After World War II, the family moved to Gatsk, and at age 16, Yuri went to work as an apprentice at Steelworks. During this time, he took evening classes, and after graduation, moved to Saratov, where he studied at the Industrial Technical School. He volunteered at the local flying club, flying Yak-18 aircraft at the weekends, as an air cadet. To make ends meet, he also worked as a labourer at the docks on the Volga River. In 1955, at the age of 21, he was admitted to Air Force Pilot School in Orenburg and shortly after started training in the MiG-15 aircraft. At 5 foot 2 inches or 157 centimetres, Yuri wasn't tall by today's standards and he struggled landing the two-seater training plane because he had difficulty seeing out of the cockpit and was almost dismissed from pilot training. Yuri was given one last chance to successfully land the MiG-15 and Yuri's instructor gave him a cushion to sit on to improve his view. Because of this, Yuri landed the aircraft perfectly. On November the 7th, 1957, Yuri graduated from Orenburg, and on the very same day married his girlfriend, Valentina Goryacheva, who was a medical technician graduate at Orenburg. They had two daughters together, Elena and Galina. At this time, the Soviet space program was accelerating and the space race was on to put a human into space. And so the search was on to find willing and able pilots. So towards the end of 1959, at the age of 25, Yuri volunteered for the Soviet space program. The selection program was rigorous. 154 pilots were shortlisted and went through the intense psychological and physical tests. Pilots had to be between the ages of 25 and 30, weigh less than 72 kilograms or 11 stone 5, and be below 170 centimetres or 5 7 inches tall. So Yuri was a perfect fit. Finally, just 20 pilots made it through to training, and as Yuri was hugely popular with the other trainees, when they were asked to vote for who they thought should be the pilot to go into space, all but three of them voted for him. The State Commission meeting on April the 8th, 1961, just four days before the launch, nominated that Yuri Gagarin would be the primary pilot and his friend and colleague, German Titov, would be his backup. So 60 years ago, on April the 12th, it was launch day. On the bus on the way to the launch pad, Yuri needed to pee and asked the bus driver to stop. He famously got off the bus and christened its back right-hand tyre for good luck. And this superstition still continues today, with all cosmonauts and astronauts taking off from Baikonur. Even Tim Peake did it. Now I know what you're thinking. How do female cosmonauts do this? Well, they just prepare a cup beforehand, so that they can splash the rear wheel. Now Baikonur has a bit of mystery behind it, because the Soviets launched their rockets from many launch sites during the Cold War, but called them all Baikonur, just to keep the world guessing where they actually launched from. 
It wasn't until the 20th of December 1995 when Russian President Boris Yeltsin officially renamed Leninsk, the area we now know today as Baikonur. Take a look at this. Yuri entered the Vostok 1 rocket at 4.10 a.m. UTC. Launch was two hours away, so Yuri checked in with Sergei Korolev at Mission Control. He was the genius behind the Soviet space program, and he was so nervous that he was given a pill to calm him down. At this time, 50% of the Soviet launches were unsuccessful, and everyone was aware of the odds. Unbelievably, during this time, Yuri asked for some music to be played and he was described as really calm. Half an hour prior to his launch, his pulse rate was just 64 beats per minute. At 6.07 a.m. UTC, the engines fired, and the launch began. And Yuri famously said, Boyakali, or let's go. Goodbye until we meet soon, dear friends. Yuri had no control of the spacecraft, and the Soviet scientists were unsure what the effects of space would be. So to play it safe, Korolov gave the override codes to Yuri in case of an emergency. Eleven minutes after liftoff, as the Vostok 1 capsule passed over the Soviet Union, Yuri reported, The craft is operating normally. I can see the Earth in the viewport. Everything is proceeding as planned. He was focused on his mission, however the incredible achievement of getting a man into space, just 16 years after the USSR was devastated by war, could not have been lost on him. At 53 minutes into the flight at 7am UTC, as Vostok 1 passed over the Straits of Magellan, at the tip of South America, This is Radio Moscow. Today, the 12th of April, 1961, the first cosmic space ship named Vostok was orbited round the Earth from the Soviet Union with a citizen of the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republic on board, Major Yuri Gagarin. News that was to shake the world. The flight had been designed so that if retrofire was unsuccessful, Yuri would fall to Earth naturally after 10 days. The orbit was higher than planned though, so the natural orbit would have been 20 days, far, far longer than Yuri's supplies would have lasted. Fortunately, retrofire occurred successfully about one hour into the flight and started to bring Yuri home. It was a very bumpy ride due to the faulty separation of the service module and the capsule. Yuri wrote, The spacecraft started spinning around on its axis at very high speed. One moment I see Africa, another moment I see the horizon, another I see the sky. I barely had time to shave myself from the sun, so the light did not blind my eyes. But I did not close the blinds because I wanted to see for myself what was going on. Finally, over the Mediterranean Sea, the module separated. There is still debate as to why this happened. Some speculated that the cables burnt through on re-entry, separating the modules. Some say that temperature sensor triggered the separation. However, separation did occur, and the re-entry capsule successfully entered the atmosphere. The bright glow of re-entry was visible behind the windshields. The thermal protection crackled, and an alarming smell of burning entered the capsule. Yuri opened the hatch and evacuated from the capsule still strapped to the ejection seat. This meant he landed separate from his capsule, a fact the Soviet Union lied about until 1971. The rules for the record book set by the FIA in 1961 stated that the pilot had to land with the spacecraft to be considered for the record. As Yuri descended from the sky in his parachute and bright orange spacesuit, local farm workers came running to find out what was going on. On landing, he put his hands in the air and said, Don't be afraid. I am a Soviet just like you who has descended from space and I must find a telephone to call Moscow. So after contacting Moscow, the Soviet Union made a radio announcement telling the world that Yuri Gagarin had landed safely. And this is how the UK reported Yuri's epic journey. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the news. All Moscow is waiting to give a hero's welcome to the world's first spaceman, Major Gagarin of the Soviet Air Force. And to begin the bulletin, here's a Moscow recording of his voice speaking to Russian scientists as he went through space. Major Gagarin said that the flight was going on successfully, normal, 
visibility was good and that he himself was feeling good as well. Major Gagarin was sent up in his four and a half ton spaceship from somewhere in the Soviet Union soon after seven o'clock this morning our time and about 148 minutes later he was brought down again after his 25,000 mile an hour flight around the earth at heights ranging between 105 and 181 miles. As he looked down on the earth from the loneliness of space he streaked across Asia, Africa and South America constantly checking his instruments and controlling the pitch and roll of the ship by firing small correcting rockets. During his flight his reactions were checked by radio and television devices. When he got down, Major Gagarin said in a message to Mr. Khrushchev, the landing was normal, I feel well, I have no injuries or bruises. When he was told the momentous news in Ottawa, Mr. Macmillan said, it's a very notable achievement, I'm sending a message of congratulation to Mr. Khrushchev. The Prime Minister is now flying home after his three-week tour of the West Indies, the United States and Canada. President Kennedy, too, has sent congratulations to the Soviet Union. In New York, all-night radios broadcast the news in special news flashes, and the New York Times carried in its last editions a treble headline. Soviet launches a man into orbit, maintains radio contact, contact with him, first human in space feels well. The director of the National Space Agency, Mr. James Webb, called the flight a splendid achievement adding that he hoped the Russians would make available to scientists the information they gained from the experiment. Most of the photos that you will see of Yuri in his spacesuit will show his helmet with CCCP in red letters on it. However, there are some photos without the letters. Knowing that he would probably land in a rural location, Yuri asks somebody to paint CCCP, an abbreviation for the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, which is what Russian was called before the end of the Cold War, on his helmet just before his launch, mainly because he didn't want to be mistaken for an invader from the West with the possibility of getting shot, and also so that the world's press could see that he was from the Soviet Union. Following his historic flight, Yuri became a national hero. The scale of the celebrations in cities across the USSR were second only to those commemorating the end of World War II. He was paraded through the streets of Moscow on his way to a ceremony at the Kremlin, where the Premier of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, awarded him Hero of the Soviet Union. The world embraced the brave young cosmonaut and his winning smile as he went on a tour in 30 countries around the globe including Germany, Canada, Brazil, Japan and the UK. Downpour notwithstanding, Manchester left Yuri Gagarin in no doubt that the great city had never had a more welcome visitor. The spaceman is a natural if ever there was one. No wonder millions fell for him. The amalgamated union of foundry workers made him number one honorary member and gave him a gold medal. Union President Fred Hollingsworth said all the members felt that Yuri was honouring them by his acceptance. In a way, he was one of them, because in his younger days, Gagarin worked as a moulder. Back in London, the mansion house, where another hero's welcome awaited this amazing man. And it was raining there too. Yuri must have thought that all the jokes about a typical English summer were well-founded. 
with the Lord Mayor, Sir Bernard Whaley Cohen, he waved to the thousands of city workers. Then to the tower, steeped in history going back to 1078. There was such a crush of children and holidaymakers that the men of space hardly had space to move. But there, as everywhere else, he seemed to be enjoying it all to the full. And what a contrast, the Tudor dress of the Beef Eaters and the man who, three months ago, went into orbit round the Earth. The next call was at Admiralty House to see the Prime Minister. Mr Macmillan said, he's a delightful fellow, which just about sums up what everybody thought. Yuri had presented the Premier with an autographed book describing his flight in space. At Buckingham Palace next day, the astronaut lunched with the Queen. Her Majesty, her ministers and all her subjects have been captivated by the charm of Major Yuri Gagarin. Never has Moscow sent a finer ambassador. On the 6th of November 1963, he moved up the ranks to Colonel and returned to the cosmonaut facility at Star City as Deputy Training Director to work on designs for a reusable spacecraft. During this time, Yuri was the backup for pilot Vladimir Komarov, who was due to flying Soyuz 1. The Soyuz 1 launch was rushed due to political pressure, despite Yuri's concerns that additional safety precautions had not been implemented. On the 24th of April 1967, Soyuz 1 crashed on its return to Earth after parachute failure and Vladimir Komarov was killed. After the accident, Yuri never returned to space because the authorities banned him from further spaceflight missions due to concerns about losing a national hero in a similar accident. Although he couldn't return to space, he began training to re-qualify as a fighter pilot. On the 27th of March 1968, during a training flight, the MiG-15 in which he and his flight instructor Vladimir Seryogin were flying crashed near the town of Kurzak, and both of them were killed. The cause of the crash still remains somewhat of a mystery. Some have blamed the combination of errors by ground crew and air traffic controllers, whilst a more prominent theory in recent years involves a near miss with another aircraft which caused Yuri's MiG-15 to enter an uncontrollable spiral dive. Seen to be remembered, the entire Soviet nation in mourning, the world in sympathy. Yuri Gagarin, the first spaceman, was dead, killed in a plane crash. With him on that tragic flight was Vladimir Seregin, test pilot. Gagarin and his comrade were given a full military funeral. The Russian people, the Soviet chiefs of state and fellow cosmonauts paid their last respects. Gagarin's widow and children were comforted by spacewoman Valentina Tereshkova. Sadly and solemnly, the procession made its way to the Kremlin, where the ashes of the two heroes of the Soviet Union were to rest forever in the mighty walls. As the mourners said their silent goodbyes, the world remembered that wonderful day in April 1961 when Yuri Gagarin soared free of Earth for 108 glorious minutes. It was the greatest of all human adventures, the beginning of a new chapter for mankind. Gagarin's name will never be forgotten. Yuri Gagarin and his achievements have been commemorated in a number of ways. Since 1962, the 12th of April, the date that Yuri flew into space, has been celebrated in the Soviet Union as Cosmonautics Day. And in 2001, the world followed suit when Yuri's night was created. In 2011, the United Nations also marked this date as the International Day of Human Spaceflight. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin left a memorial satchel containing medals of honour for Gagarin and Kormorov on the moon during the Apollo 11 mission. And one of the craters on the far side of the moon is also called Gagarin Crater. The Cosmonaut Training Centre in Star City was renamed Gagarin, and in 1968 the town of Gatsk, where Yuri grew up after the war, was also renamed 
and it is simply called Gagarin in honour of its hero. Yuri's daughter Elena grew up with a love for science and history and is now the director of Moscow's Kremlin Museums. Yuri was a man of few words, but when he did speak in public, his words were very profound. Here's a speech he gave just after his space flight in 1961. Orbiting the Earth in the spaceship, I saw how beautiful our planet is. People, let's preserve and increase its beauty, not destroy it. Now that was 60 years ago. We still have a lot to learn. Before I end this video, I'd like to encourage you all to look up, raise a glass to the sky, and as a brave man once said, Poyakali, let's go.